I don't think it's uh, um, it's it's uh, much of a coincidence that some of the best best known, most successful companies. Uh, uh, are still run by their founders. Mike I, Moritz is here. He is the chairman of Sequoia Capital. It is one of Silicon Valley's most prominent venture capital firms. It has made successful investments in Google, Yahoo, and LinkedIn, among others. He began his career as a journalist at Time Magazine. I am pleased to have him here at this table for the first time. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you at this table. Likewise. I want to go back <laughs> to Europe. Tell me about your grandfather and your father and coming here. So my, uh, both my parents were born in Nazi Germany, uh, or they were born in Germany, and then the Nazis uh, came into power. And uh, like uh, um, a lot of other um, Jews, um, obviously the future wasn't there for them, and uh, their parents organized um, their departure uh, in the mid-1930s to... Uh, to Britain. Um, my mother and father didn't know each other at that point. They met later in Britain. And uh, both my mother and my father uh, were lucky enough to get scholarships to attend high school in the, in the case of my mother and then high school and university uh, in, the, in the case of my father. And my, par and my mother's parents escaped from Germany right at the end of August 1939. Mm. And my uh, father's parents, like a lot of the rest of the family, never escaped, and they were they were murdered, and like millions of others. And uh, but then my uh, mother and father both made their lives after the end of World War II uh, in Great Britain, which is where I was born and educated and raised, and until I came to America. Well, raised where? I was in Cardiff? Uh, in Cardiff in South Wales, which is um, a city of, it's the largest city in Wales, but uh, it's about 200,000 people on the Welsh coast, about um, oh, 40 miles away from where Dylan Thomas and Richard Burton yeah. were born and about 15 miles from where that other uh, uh, famous Welshman, Tom Jones, was born. <laughs> <laughs> and what got you to Oxford? How uh, did you get to Oxford? My, I, I went to a regular high school um, in Britain, and uh, there were teachers who were uh, encouraging of, of students to try their best. And also, my father had been educated at, at Oxford on, on a scholarship. Yeah. So, it while it it, it it seemed unattainable for uh, Oxford or Cambridge seemed unattainable for most of the my contemporaries when I was at high school. It seemed within reach at least for me, so I gave it a shot and uh, wound up there in the early 1970s. But um, I uh, enjoyed the extramural life there and got involved with um, the university magazine. Yes, and. Uh, uh, enjoyed that a lot, yeah. and uh, like to write, and, or like to edit, and also it was uh, people were very kind. Politicians, in particular, were were very kind, and they. It was easy to get an interview with fairly illustrious people. Yeah. So, uh, with the university magazine, we used to truck around and we'd see all these well-known people, and then write about them. And it was sort of my first entree into that world, and I loved it. Love journalism. Oh, yes, absolutely. Because, you know, every... This uh, little magazine appeared fortnightly, and every, every fortnight we had 32 pages, which we didn't know what to do with, except we had four pages of advertising from a, from a chain called Mothercare, um, who, whose owner very kindly took care of the sort of uh, rinky-dink financial side of this magazine, and then we had to fill it up with uh, editorial yeah. copies. So. What... what made you decide to go to the United States? I had one of these weird coincidences of life. Um, th there was a gentleman who is today unknown in America and isn't very well known uh, in Britain anymore because he died some years ago, but his name was Bill Deeds, and he was the editor of the uh, Daily Telegraph newspaper. And he was a giant in British journalism. He had been the character on which Evelyn Waugh had rested yeah. his novel, Scoop. Um, and 
I went to see him to apply for a job uh, on Fleet Street right. um, after, uh, for after I left um, university. And the trouble was that there were very strict union rules. And the union rules in Britain forbade the uh, broadsheets of Fleet Street from hiring undergrads directly from university. And you had to go and work for several years on a pr small provincial newspaper before you could be allowed to work on, on Fleet Street. And Deed said, were he my age, he wouldn't waste his time with Fleet Street he'd go to America. Mm. And that was what convinced me to try my luck here. Actually, you know, it, it resonates with me in this way. I know some people who are saying, you know, if I was a young entrepreneur coming out of business school today, uh -huh. I would go to Asia. Uh -huh. I think most entrepreneurs don't come out of business school. They come out of engineering schools. Uh, what skills do you wish you had that would enable you uh, to better do your job in venture capital? Oh, the any number of skills, uh, and more particularly knowledge that I wish that I had that I don't possess. And you know, we invest across, uh, in, a, in a fairly broad waterfront of, of technology, but to be really well educated and a specialist in, in any one of those things uh, requires a very deep immersion, a deep immersion in software or bioinformatics or the various underlying sciences. And I wish I'd had uh, a better formal scientific education when, uh, when I was younger. That more than anything uh, would, uh, would have helped me, I think. But Here's what you said. You said, my undergraduate degree was in history. I wish I'd been smart enough to really excel at math or physics or chemistry right. or biology because the voyagers and the adventurers that's and where the they real contributors that's come where, from there. That's where they start from. And I, I, yes, I don't quarrel with any part of that sentiment. I think those are today's voyagers. And they start off with a grounding in those particular sciences. And do the business school grads become transactional people and go to Wall Street and go to financial institutions? It's, a, it's obviously, Charlie, unfair to, 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 to paint a broad uh, um, brush here. And there's some very talented people who come out of the business schools mm -hmm. but, uh, and who join these companies and are very vital parts of helping the companies um, get off the ground. And there are a number of them who have started companies that became significant. But the germ of an idea of a breakthrough in technology, of a, you know, evolution in a realm of science does not come out of a business school curriculum. It comes out of a laboratory or a maths lecture or a physics tutorial of some sort. Um, and I think that's where, um, where, where or, or, or say in the case of somebody many years ago like Bill Gates from uh, an avocation that he had as a teenager that he just deeply immersed himself yeah. in. And decided that it was more important to go do it than stay in college. Yeah, it was his, Train was it was his calling. He was not unlike a lot of other, or a number of other remarkable people in their teens, whether they went on to become a musician or an artist or perhaps an entrepreneur. They discovered their, or oh, uh, perhaps like Warren Buffett, who discovered Started investing when he was, when he was 11. 11 or 12. 11, yeah. These people, whether they were using piano keys or a paintbrush or a computer keyboard or a pencil paper in the, in the case of Warren Buffett, they discovered their calling at a young age and they fell in love with it. And uh, that's a, a very common theme for the people that we encounter as they then okay. start to develop Your ideas Your job is to find them and test their idea. Yeah, and then to and be... A rigorous examination of its potential. And then to be business partners with them for a very long time. Because I don't think it's an accident that many of these people who start something when they're very young then spend decades building those businesses. I want to come back to that yeah. because that all came after you were, uh, right. went to Sequoia. So you're in London, you talk to Mr. <coughs> the man at the Daily Telegraph, yeah. and he says, I'd go to America. Yeah. That's where I'd go. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so you come here. I came here um, and I couldn't afford to come here. So I 
applied for a bunch of scholarships to American universities and luckily enough got one that took me to the University of Pennsylvania. And Wharton? Well, actually, no. <laughs> not originally. It was uh, for a master's in history. And then I wasn't too happy with the first few weeks of that program and was wondering what else to do because I knew I wanted to be in America. Yeah. And they were very kind and let me transfer into, into the business school. But the very best thing that happened to me at, there was having, uh, being in a class with the author Philip Roth. Yeah. So my, my <laughs> abiding memory of, of, of the University of Pennsylvania is uh, being introduced to Philip Roth and he had these people like Norman Mailer and other people who'd come through the right. class and that was just fantastic. Uh, you make your way to Time Magazine. Yes. And you write about Steve Jobs. I, actually before that, yeah, I did write about Steve well, Jobs. Okay, but before but that, me. I um, went to Detroit for year, a year of battle hardening in 1979 as the automobile industry was collapsing and it was uh, and that was where actually I, I uh, co-authored a book about the Chrysler Corporation and uh, Lee Iacocca who was a, this larger than life figure yeah. who obviously was a household name 25, 30 years ago um, and that was my introduction to mainstream journalism and then I moved to California first to Los Angeles, yeah. and um, where I found myself gravitating to Northern California to do stories about all these little companies that nobody had heard of. You know, Genentech was private, right. Apple was just about public, Microsoft was still private company, and I started writing about them and gradually got more interested and then eventually wound up moving to San Francisco with time. And what was Steve Jobs like then? It's probably, Steve is probably an example of, like many, many people, of, of the truism that you never take the boy out of the man. <laughs> and so many of the traits that people um, became familiar with um, in the last few years of his life were um, on full display um, 30 years ago. Uh, a spectacular communicator, a wonderful salesman, uh, a man on messianic m mission when he uh, set his mi mind to something, a taskmaster, a disciplinarian, a man who is difficult to please, but also, and, and very difficult obviously as well, but also an extraordinarily mesmerizing figure captivating figure, probably without doubt the most interesting person I've met. Ever? In your Ever. life? Clearly. It was, yes, no doubt, no doubt. You became friends? Uh, no, we had a... He wanted me to write a, a, a flattering book about Apple. <laughs> Um, I'm on, I'd approached him about writing a book about Apple. This is in the early 1980s yeah. when nothing had been written about it. But I was interested in trying to get into, uh, really understand and portray how difficult it was to build a, uh, build a, a company. And I wasn't interested in the public aspects of, or Apple as a public company. I was interested in the private years from when they had the idea to going through all the ups and downs, all the stuff that was outside of the public view. Steve really wanted a piece of puffery about the birth of the Macintosh computer, <laughs> which I, I understood that, but yeah. that's not the book that I wanted to write. And so I wrote a book about, uh, 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 about Apple, and, and along the way, um, there were a couple of stories about him that had appeared in Time magazine that ir more than irritated him. And so after that, our uh, relationship became distant um, and you know in the in the last decade or so it was intermittent and it was just related to, to business uh, to business things but we weren't friends why did you go to Sequoia Capital you're a journalist you're a writer I'd re there was you're some interested in the way things <clears throat> work and how things happen I don't know whether or not this is true but somewhere I remember reading 
that Ernest Hemingway said, journalism, and I beg your pardon here, Charlie, but journalism is not a place to be for people over the age of 30. And I think he was wrong about that, but for some reason it lodged in my 29-year-old brain. Yeah. And I had got very interested in all these young and private companies and yeah. all the people surrounding them and had met a lot of them thanks to, thanks to time and decided that, um, that I wanted a change. And I left time not to join Sequoia Capital, but to start a company right. with um, a friend of mine from the Wall Street Journal. And we started a little publishing company, which was what you expect of two former journalists who didn't know anything. Uh, so we just did what we knew. And um, I did that for a time. But then it was clear to me it was going to be a nice little business, but never a large business. And th th many, many years later, Dow Jones wound up buying it. But um, I had gone by then gone on and, and joined Sequoia Capital. So when you join Sequoia Capital, um, it's been hugely successful. I mean, it's now legendary, Thank along you. with Kleiner Thank and, and uh, uh, several you. other Excel uh, venture capital firms. Mm -hmm. What's made it successful? Google, LinkedIn, YouTube, PayPal, Yahoo, Zappos, I and think, you, very rich. I think we've we've always been afraid of going out of business. Really, fear, fear. And competitive drive. Really? Only the paranoid survive. Some, someone famous said that. <laughs> but, uh, I, there's a lot of truth to that. Because when, when we become a business partner of a young company, and it doesn't always work out like this, but we go into it with the hopes that this company can endure for a long time. It can be built and then it can be one of these rare enduring companies. Now, obviously, many, m the majority of companies don't attain that, but that's given us the opportunity to think very hard about what it is that causes some companies to prosper for a very long time and others to have their moment in the sun and then mm. fade away. And what happens to a company can happen to a firm like Sequoia Capital as well. So we've worked very, very hard to think about what does it take to excel in every decade of the business that we've been in. Because it's hard to have a, a fellow called Don Valentine started Sequoia Capital right. in 1974. That's a long, long time ago. It's before Apple, before Atari, before many of the companies that have, in the interim, come and gone. And so we've worked hard on, on uh, trying to figure out how we make Sequoia Capital endure. And I think that's been the reason uh, why we've been able to do what we've been able to do, because we've assumed that tomorrow isn't like yesterday. We can't afford to rest on our laurels. We can't be complacent. We can't assume that yesterday's success translates into tomorrow's good fortune. Is venture capital as attractive today as it was 10 years ago? It's probably more attractive, really? oddly enough. And is I, it doing I, as well today as it was doing, you know, when you were bringing on stream Google and companies like that? It, it's a business that's always had um, the returns, the investment returns, concentrated in very few hands. So many of the companies don't succeed, they don't flourish, they don't become one of these enduring companies. Many of the firms, venture firms associated with these companies don't succeed. They're around for five years or for 10 years, but they're not around for 40 or 50 years. Um, but for people who know what they're doing in Silicon Valley and elsewhere where in good pockets of venture capital around the world, the business is actually, oddly enough, better and it's better because the investment menu is longer than it's ever been and the investment menu is longer than it's ever been because technology has seeped into more and more crevices and and nooks of the economy because when i started at sequoia capital there's no way that we would have considered investing 
in uh, a payments company, a financial services company, a media company, an advertising company. All of those sorts of things we've invested in quite happily uh, you know, for the last changed? 15 years. It was technology and seeping out to be seeping out s- everywhere. At the core of every business. Exactly. And where technology goes, we follow. You've been outspoken, or at least you've made public statements saying, you know, wait, don't be so critical of Apple because of the decline in the stock price. Mm -hmm. Uh, You believe in the future of Apple and there's nothing, uh, no reason not to be excited about the continued growth of that company. I'm not a soothsayer. Well, all I was trying to do in the pandemonium after they announced their results recently was just try to paint a picture of realistic expectations for a company that is now as large as Apple is. And second largest company in the world. And the Market point camp. that I was making was that if um, the gro- their growth rate of the last five years was uh, to continue, by 2020, it would be equivalent in size to somewhere between the GDP of France and GDP of Germany. And people should be realistic about their future growth expectations for the company. And you think <clears throat> that the po- their, their growth expectations... Their, their growth expectations were, um, <clears throat> uh, were unrealistic. It, you cannot... To, uh, you know, Google, uh, Apple in, in, the last, uh, in the last quarter was running at a 200, what, $200 billion a year annualized sales rate. Right. One-fifth of a trillion dollars. You can't grow that at 45% a year at uh, infinitum. Mm. It's just physically impossible. It's the physics of it. Yeah. yeah the bigger yeah. you get, the and less. That was the only point um, I, mean, I was trying to make, was just to help give people a sense of perspective. I want you to take a look at this, because I want to talk about Google and how you see it. This is Roger uh, McNamee here on this program, talking about the challenge for Google, a company that probably has given you as good a return as you've ever received. So if you look at what they're trying to do with, uh, with Android, which is their mobile operating right. system, Google's basically saying, we're the alternative to Apple, and we're going to have every operator making their own device. They're doing basically what Microsoft did with Windows. They're giving a lot of latitude to people to make changes. The problem is that there are no economic incentives to maintain a cohesive platform. And the result is some people like Amazon have made Kindle fires out of the thing that are incompatible with everything else. Right. And so they, in technology, they would say this product has forked. It has all these different versions that don't speak to each other. So you can't write one application on Android and have it work across all the products. Mm-hmm. That's a problem. Well, if I were Google, I wouldn't even be trying that. I'd sit there and go, wait a minute. My world is the world of the web. And there's going to be a next generation web. There's a new technology called HTML5. All that that. is is the programming language around which the web is built. So if you think, what's the web built in? It's built in HTML. And all HTML5 is the next version. There hasn't been a new one for 12 years. Now, if you were Google and you dominated the old one, I would have thought the logical strategy was to try to obsolete apps by giving people something that where the gave the publisher total control and the consumer total control. Mm. But Google isn't doing that. So is Roger right? Uh, I, I think he paints too pessimistic a, a view of the future yeah. uh, for, for Google. Um, it's an extremely well-run company. Uh, there are um, lots of avenues uh, for it to expand. Uh, it's got a. Um, it, it's no coincidence that if you're using Apple products, Google Maps is the best place uh, to find anything. They're very well positioned in the in the mobile business. Um, Android, Apple people found that out, didn't they? They did. Android is now the, uh, you know, has the majority share of uh, new handsets that are sold around the world. Why is that? Uh, Because they made it very easy um, to to license the operating system and because uh, most handset vendors don't have the software know-how and techniques that Google have assembled and therefore are very happy to uh, license uh, Google's work. And then, uh, don't forget, they also have large properties like YouTube. Uh, You know, YouTube... Uh, is a bigger business than Netflix, for example, today. So all of that is tucked under. So people people have uh, painted too bleak a view of the prospects for uh, for Google for a long There's time. There's also this idea. Yes. Google, Apple, 
Facebook, Amazon, yes. are all in a battle to own something. What is it? The future? It's the intergalactic dance of the elephantine companies that all of whom, wonderfully for the consumer, have very demanding taskmasters and they all cooperate with one another in the mornings and compete ferociously in the afternoon. But all of them want to have as much of the future as they possibly can. And the, the beneficiaries, uh, mm. you and me and everybody else. Better so products. Better products. Because they're stimulating one another to be better. Competition. Which is, fant which is fantastic. Competition is good for all of us. For all of us. Who's going to win? I think they'll all do. I think they'll all thrive. Yeah. Now, when I brought that up with Bill Gates, he said, how about Microsoft? Yes. And he also said, don't forget Samsung. Yes. It seemed to be a coming power. I'm told at the Consumer Electronics yeah. Show, yeah. they had a real presence there. Uh, they do. Samsung is a formidable adversary. Um, it's really taken the place of Japan in consumer electronics. And in other words, you buy Samsung TVs rather than Sony TVs. And cell phones. And, and computers. Cell phones and computers. And don't How did they do it? Samsung is, is not a company I pretend to know well. You know, it's, it's this Korean behemoth but that got in the technology business. It got its start in the semiconductor business mm. a long time ago. Yeah. So they, weirdly enough, sell a lot of memory devices, memory chips to Apple. They're Apple's biggest memory chip supplier. Uh, but clearly an enormous force uh, in the business today. And, and Android has been there. Uh, uh, Android has uh, been their operating, uh, system. operating system. And Bill's exactly right um, that they are a massive force with which to contend for all of these companies. What do you think of Amazon? I uh, have enormous admiration for what they've been able to do mm. at Amazon. It's such an inventive company. It never looks back, always it looks back. It never looks back. They've, they've been brave enough to cannibalize their own business with the Kindle and sure. digital books, and they've been brave enough to take on Microsoft and Google with their um, cloud server computing yeah. initiative, AWS, where they've thrived. Um, they're obviously thinking about the future of all sorts of commerce and logistics with these huge hubs and distribution centers yeah. they're putting all over the place. Uh, endlessly inventive. And, I, you know, I know Jeff Bezos is, is fond of saying and has said for years, I've been an avid reader of, of his annual reports as soon as he posts his annual reports, that it's still barely the end of Chapter 1 for Amazon. Yes. And I think he's absolutely right. Yeah. Always inventive. Always look at it. Fantastic. Ahead. Exactly. Fantastic. Facebook. Yeah. Uh, if you talk to them, obviously they know that their future has to do with you know, A, monetization, B, uh, mobile, mm -hmm. C, getting ads on mobile. Yes. And Is that uh, a big problem for them? It's, it's an opportunity for them, which I think they will... Uh, um, and you can you can see it in the, you know in the last few months. Uh, again, a year ago, people were writing off Facebook and mobile, and and they've regalvanized their company. They're attacking mobile with great vigor, and uh, a network of that size, um, they'll do very well. Do you like to see founders running companies? Love it, uh, and uh, I don't think it's. Uh, um, it's it's uh, much of a coincidence that some of the best best known, most successful companies uh, uh, are still run by their founders. I look at Larry Ellison at uh, Oracle, for example, probably now 40, 40 plus years. What is his genius? Unquenchable thirst, I think. And <laughs> ferocious. How would you define unquenchable ferocious, thirst? Ferocious competitiveness. Yeah. See, it's always this quality of wanting it more than everybody else. What Steve had, you know, yeah. the the sense. It's the human factor. I I I think so. Well, you ought to know. I mean, you I put think, your money and your stake on. I think it, I, it is because you can have lots of other people attacking the same opportunity. And, mm. and, and uh, it's that very rare individual 
um, who, who flourishes, particularly over the long term. You know, a bubbly market can conceal all sorts of imperfections in, in any of us, but over the long term, I think it's the remarkable, the few remarkable characters that survive. And also, they're the precedents of these companies like Sony, which was a company that, um, after Akio Morita, its founder, yeah. uh, um, died or, or relinquished the, the reins, then had qu quite a long struggle. I think part of the whole reason that the U.S. And I'm a sort of amateur student of the U.S. automobile industry. I think part of the reason that it ran into trouble was way before the 1970s. It was because the founders of those companies had relinquished the reins to business people, not product people. But as soon as you say that, mm -hmm. I would make this observation. Look what happened to Ford. Yes. CEO of Ford. Yes. Yeah. Did uh, not grow up in the car business, was not an engineer, but was an, a superb manager. And great sensibility for product. And I, I think, say, yeah, yeah. And I think that's the element that gets missed a lot of the time. Uh, in these management, in these management uh, um, turnovers, and particularly for a technology company, you absolutely have to have as the guiding force of an abiding, enduring technology company a person or people at the helm who have products in their DNA. Yeah. Who love, who who are crazed by the idea of making that thing better, better, the best. Or do it, making it better or the best, or have this inventive desire like Larry Page for driverless cars or Jeff oh, yeah. Bezos for space. space or whatever the next grand adventure is, this endlessly so curious... So it's the adventure, point. too. It's, it's the it's product it's in that DNA, but also the grand sense of adventure. Because... There's also this about them. Walter Isaacson captured this with Steve mm -hmm. Jobs. The thing he was proudest of was not the iPhone or the iPad. It was Apple. Yep. He built Apple. That was his baby. Yep. People ask me what my favorite investment is. Which is, what is? And I always say Sequoia Capital. Because that's what you built. Help build. Oh, you've given up the reins because the management range. Range, yes. Not the. Uh, Your chairman. I'm, I, I'm very involved with the investments that we oh. do, but not the management, the day-to-day -day management of the business. Because of an illness. Because yes. You walked into a doctor and he said, "Well, I was diagnosed with a rare orphan condition." Um, six or seven years ago, which I kept to myself and then had an encounter that I didn't want to have particularly with some doctors at the beginning of last year and decided I had a choice. I could um, continue leading the life, managing things that I'd been doing, but I was going to take more time off and because I needed that for myself and my family. Uh, I could pretend nothing had changed and just take more time off or I could do what I elected to do and I just felt given our work ethic at Sequoia you could not have a, a leader of the business taking off 10 weeks 12 weeks a year it set the wrong example for everybody and um, that's why I chose to do what I did. Uh, did you think of Steve at that when you made those decisions? Throughout the last few years um, it's never been very far from my mind so um, and I think he bore his illness with one of the things that never get or doesn't get said enough about him with extraordinary courage and bravery and uh, just remarkable so uh, but um, I, I'm very hopeful that, uh, as, as a, a friend of mine said to me, general prognoses don't mean much. It's the individual that matters, and so um, I, I'm uh, set to de defy the statisticians. Yes. Uh, You're on but, a lot of boards, too. Yes. 
Why do you stay on board? Love it. <laughs> um, particularly the younger companies. Yeah. Um, there is nothing more invigorating than uh, being deeply involved with a small company and uh, a young team of founders out to do something incredibly special. Yeah. And they're off on a voyage and uh, everybody's Betting against us. It's a, it's another mission impossible. It's a, another thing everybody says that we're never going to be able to yeah. do. Um, it's, a, it's a great feeling to believe that you can play some small or larger role yeah. in helping somebody who is obsessively driven towards their dream give them something to add to their own drive to get to the dream. It's, it's very fulfilling. And I'm the, the most important thing, obviously, in any of this, the, the people who've, the founders of these companies who've come up with the idea, and they're living this seven days a week, 24, you know, 24 hours a day. And we try and be as helpful and, and um, uh, an ally to them as, as conceivably possible. But we're not mistaken about, uh, about, uh, about our role. If we can help, if we can play uh, a small part um, in their eventual um, success, mm. uh, that's fantastic. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Pleasure to have you here. Likewise.